We've learned that one of the consequences that of gases not being ideal gases is that they can undergo phase changes, and in particular they can undergo condensation. What I want to do in this video is to talk a little bit more about the phase transition that goes on uh, that produces gases, so in other words vaporization processes, and I, I want to use a, a PV diagram and the isotherms on it to help illustrate some points to help you qualitatively understand this transition a little bit better. So I've uh, reproduced a diagram on here that, uh, that I took off the internet, and um, you can see several isotherms here basically uh, as before, as we move outward from the origin, T is going to be increasing. Now these T values are not specified, but that's okay. They have specified which one is the critical temperature, the critical isotherm. It's this one here, and you can see it rests right on the top of this uh, blue uh, coexistence region where we find both liquid and vapor in equilibrium with one another, and that's what's indicated by this label up here. All right, so how do we read this? How do we understand something about the liquid to vapor transition? So let me write that up here, liquid to vapor. Now, mind you, similar things would be, uh, could be discovered also about the solid to vapor transition, but the liquid to vapor one is the one that we encounter more commonly, so I wanna focus on that one. Now, first of all, we know that as we go from the liquid region, the liquid region is going to be everything that is on the, on the left and the downside of the critical isotherm. So maybe I should draw the critical isotherm in a little bit heavier color here so that we can easily find it in the diagram. So basically everything over to this side of that critical isotherm as well as this liquid vapor coexistence region marked here in light blue, everything over here is a liquid. Now one of the things that we can tell about this, if, if everything over here is a vapor, is that in order to go from the liquid to the vapor, what do we have to do? We have to cross several isotherms, and the isotherms we're crossing are increasing the temperature. So I think this is probably goes without saying, but for a phase transition like this, the change in temperature is always going to be greater than zero. We have to increase the temperature in order to go from a liquid to a vapor. But it's, a, it's also something that we can get right off of this PV diagram, so that uh, helps us uh, be reassured that our interpretation is correct. Now, I'll also remind you that for uh, heat changes at constant pressure, we have a, an expression that says that you can calculate that uh, from the heat capacity, but I shouldn't have drawn the integral sign there, let me just uh, delete that and say it is the heat capacity at constant pressure times a differential in temperature. So if I want to get the amount of heat that's needed for a transition or for a process, I would need to go from T1 to T2 and integrate Cp dt, which if Cp is constant, which sometimes it's pretty roughly constant, we can write it like this. Well, I've just determined that delta T is greater than zero for this transition, so similarly we can deduce from this that going from liquid to vapor is going to involve an increase in the enthalpy content. So in other words, the delta H for this vaporization process must be greater than zero. Well, we probably also knew that because we know in order to change a liquid into a gas, we have to add heat. But now we have a confirmation based on our thermodynamic principles uh, that we can rely on. Now, I would point out also that with respect to this particular equation, if T2 is less than T1 for some reason, then the integration, this quantity is going to be less than zero, and we'll have heat that is also less than zero, and that will correspond to the opposite phase transition. So in other words, if we're going from a vapor to a liquid, a process that we also can refer to as condensation, then the delta H change for that process is going to be negative, or less than zero, but it's going to have the same magnitude as the positive direction. So in other words, whether delta VAP H is positive or negative depends on whether we are vaporizing, in which case it's positive, or we're condensing, in which case it'll be negative. Now there are a few other features on this phase, uh, on this pH, uh, PV diagram, sorry, uh, that I wanted to point out. One is this, uh, this coexistence region in blue. 
okay, the coexistence area. All right, this is an area in which the liquid and the vapor are in equilibrium with one another. So one way we can read this is if we're on an isotherm, and let's say we're on this very first isotherm, T1, and we go across here and we first encounter this coexistence region here, and then we leave the coexistence region here. Is there something we can learn about those two points? Well, it turns out that if we read this straight down to the volume, this point here corresponds to the molar volume of the, of the vapor at this particular isotherm, at this particular temperature. And this point here would represent the molar volume of the liquid at that same temperature. So in other words, we actually can get a handle on what is the change in the molar volume when going from a liquid to a vapor. It would be this difference that's depicted by this gap within this coexistence region. All right, if we were able to identify, for example, the, ice, the isotherm that exists uh, at one atmosphere of pressure, so maybe it's right here, then that isotherm will also tell us the temperature of vaporization. So at one atmosphere, the temperature of vaporization that is, the isotherm that we cross when we get to this coexistence region is the normal boiling point. All right, I should mention that uh, the standard boiling point is denoted when we have a pressure of one bar. So, Alas, uh, we define normal boiling points and normal melting points for one atmosphere of pressure, even though we now use bar more frequently. All right, so let me also look at the vertical is the isotherms that are existing in this region down here and in this region up here. So let's do the first region. So we've got isotherms that are like this. What do those tell us? Well in order to change the temperature, we do not need very much change in volume, and vice versa. So if delta T is large, okay, and let's presume that the difference in temperature between these, it corresponds to a delta V that is small. All right, a way to think of this, and, and actually, if I'm going across this way, I'm really on an isobar, so, uh, the way to think about this is that for a liquid, it's not very compressible. In other words, there's not a lot of volume change by changing the temperature. And in fact, this large change in pressure corresponding to a very small change in volume down here would tell us that it's not very compressible. What about out here on the right-hand side? Okay, when I have isotherms that are spaced like this. Well, now the temperature, let's say if I want to go from this isotherm to this isotherm at the same pressure, so on, on an isobar. Okay, we've got to actually change our molar volume by quite a bit. So what this tells us is that on this side of the phase diagram, that the gas is very expansive. So it doesn't take a very large change in temperature to change the volume by a lot if we keep the pressure the same. And these are things that we also know about gases, that as we increase the temperature, we're going to increase the volume. And it's pretty easy to do that because a gas is pretty fluid. However, for a liquid, we don't see as much change in volume when we change things like the pressure or the temperature. So in, th in that way, it becomes uh, fairly incompressible. So knowing how to read one of these diagrams will give you all sorts of information about a substance and will help you, uh, I think, have the right intuition, if you will, about what's happening thermodynamically as you uh, make different changes between different phases.